Every action that Jesus took that Palm Sunday was deliberate. Every single thing that he did announced who he was and what he came to do. Each of his actions fulfilled prophecy, words and actions that a people of God would recognize each supporting his claims. What were those actions? What exactly did they proclaim? And more importantly, what do they require of us? These are the questions for today. If you have your Bibles or if you need one, there's one in the pew. Open it up, please, to Mark 11. <coughs> Excuse me. You've heard parts of this story read today, but this story is so familiar to us that it's easy to miss what's there in plain sight. So I'm going to trace my way through portions of it so that you can see it and find it again. You can see it in Scripture for yourselves. I want your eyes on it. As Jesus prepared to ride into Jerusalem, he sent how many disciples? Two. He sent them to find a specific animal. What was that? It was a cult, one that had never been. He told them where to find it. He told them what to say if they were challenged. What did he not say? Well, why an unridden animal? And the answer is because the people of God would have understood the importance of that unridden animal. In the Old Testament, unridden, unbroken animals were specifically used for God's purposes in three ways. Numbers 19, 2 explains how their sacrifice was used to bring about the cleansing of God's people, setting them apart once again for the service of God. Deuteronomy 21.3 explains how their sacrifice was to be used as an announcement that justice had been accomplished and that no further guilt then remained. And 1 Samuel 6 verse 7 tells how they were used to bring about the very restoration of the place where God would meet with his people, restoring the way that we live together in relationship. Each one of those is a sermon in itself. But all of those things, Jesus himself would accomplish not in rituals that had to be continually repeated, but once and for all. That unwritten coat, cult, pardon me, was an announcement of exactly what he came to accomplish. The prophet Zechariah had written, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout! Daughter of Jerusalem, see your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. What did Jesus come riding into Jerusalem on? What was he proclaiming? He is indeed king. Are the rest of you awake? Because one of them back there proclaimed, what was he proclaiming? Thank you. The people responded shouting all the right words, <laughs> words that they knew from Psalm 118, words that they used at every single festival celebrating their deliverance from slavery, words with which they fully expected to greet the coming Messiah who would bring about their final deliverance. What were those words? What did they cry that day? Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Even the timing. And I don't have time to go into it, but even the timing of Jesus' appearance from Daniel's prophecy in chapter 9, verses 25 through 27, even that timing was perfect. Go back and read it when you have a chance. Every action that he took on Palm Sunday, every single one proclaimed him to be the king that they had waited for. His actions over the next few days were every bit as deliberate. If you read through them, you'll see it. Seeing a fig tree in full leaf. Jesus searched for fruit, but he found none. Now Mark is gracious here. He says, well, it wasn't the season for figs. But it's always the season for fruit for the people of God. Amen? Amen. And Jesus' own actions were prophetic that day. There being a rightful expectation of fruit, he cursed that which looked good, 
but produced nothing. That same day, he walked into the temple, arriving first at the court of the Gentiles. Now, if you're not familiar with the temple configuration, this outer court, this court of the Gentiles, was furthest away from the Holy of Holies because those people were not worthy to come into that presence. So there was the court of the Gentiles where they could pray. There was the court of the women. And there was the court of the men. <laughs> but the first place he walked into that day was the court of the Gentiles. This is the only place where non-Jewish people could come to worship God. For the convenience of the people of God, so that their preparations weren't that difficult at an already busy time, it had been turned into a marketplace where they, could, where, there, <laughs> where they could purchase everything necessary. A one-stop shop um, for animals, for lambs, for doves, certified to be acceptable for use as a sacrifice, a place where they could exchange their money into coin acceptable for use to pay the temple tax, so convenient for those who belonged. In truth, leaving no place for those whom God wanted to invite. Jesus turned over the tables that day. He turned over the tables of the money changers, the benches on which those purveyors of animals sat. He drove them out of that court declaring, no, this is a place of prayer. My father's house is a place of prayer. God's purpose is for his house. The people had heard, they were amazed. <laughs> but those in charge... They were incensed. <laughs> and the next day, as he arrived at the temple, they confronted him with this question. Who gave you the authority to do those things? Well, that was actually the right question to ask. He'd been proven the answer all along. To call their attention to the importance of that question, Jesus asked one of his own. John's baptism. Was it from heaven or was it from man? Now we might understand his question better as this based on our study from the last few weeks. Did you see God at work in John's baptism or was that the work of man? Jesus' point was deliberately made. If God was at work in John, then he was also at work in Jesus Christ. Whose authority is it? Well, that answer is critical, isn't it? It would either bring judgment or it would bring deliverance. The religious leaders deliberated. This was the focus of their deliberation, okay? Well, if we say from heaven, he's going to ask them, why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, what on earth are those people going to think? The question they refused to ask is what is the truth? What is the truth? If they couldn't answer that question honestly, then there really weren't any further questions to ask, were there? There was no further conversation to be held, was there? Because they'd chosen judgment because they refused to choose truth. Jesus had pointed out all that truth would require. A move from complacency and convenience to actually serving God's purposes. Fruitfulness, not just the appearance of it. And acceptance of his authority. All that Jesus did pointed deliberately to the truth of who he is. He's the king who brings cleansing, forgiveness, peace with God, restoration of relationship. So what does that require of us today? That's a really good question, isn't it? That's the first question that we have to answer for ourselves, and that answer will either bring judgment or it will bring deliverance. I hope it's a question that you've answered for yourself. Is he the truth? Is he the way? Is he the life? 
I'd love to talk to you about that if you have not, because that's the most important question that people will ever ask you. Better yet, you can make that decision today and life will change forever. As a people of God, that second question is this. How will we live? Because we have indeed recognized that truth. See, that was the question that Jesus answered in all of his actions that week. And just as they did that Palm Sunday morning, it's really easy to acclaim Jesus as king when everyone else around you is shouting and singing and it's exciting to be a part of it and there's no commitment beyond being part of a crowd. But Jesus' words and actions that week stated what was necessary for the people of God, and that is proof of their belief. Truly serving God's purposes, fruit, in keeping with what they say. They believe fruit in keeping with repentance from old ways of life and an acceptance of his authority because a king holds how much authority? Oh, that would be all of it. See, those are the questions to be asked of a people of God. Are you a people of God? I hope that would be your answer. See, those require real commitment, and that's what I'm asking of you today as we enter into what promises to be a very busy Holy Week. There's lots of opportunity to meet others who do not know Christ this week. Lots of opportunity. This week and our lives will require much of us if we are indeed going to follow and serve Jesus Christ in truth. If you'll take out the bulletin insert in your bulletin, it asks three questions of you. And they're the essence of what we've been talking about today. Those questions are these, how are you growing in this faith that you profess? That is in the knowledge of truth, who is Jesus Christ? How are you growing? What are you doing besides sitting in a pew? Second, where are you serving? Because fruit is required. Okay, that, that's not an option. Fruit is required. Jesus says it's to the Father's glory that you produce how much fruit? Well, that would be the answer, much fruit. And if you don't know how, there are some ways that you can serve him on that insert as well. Lastly, who are you sharing faith with? Because that was the final command of our King and Lord Jesus Christ, that we go and make disciples. So those are the questions I'm going to ask of you today. Brian is going to come and sing that other song. Thank you. And as he does, I'm going to give you an opportunity to fill out that sheet. And I'm going to ask you to bring it up and place it on the altar. If there's a log jam up here, so be it. If you have to kneel at the altar, so be it. But I'm going to ask that commitment of you, and then we're going to pray over those commitments. Can we do that this morning? Do you know what to do? Really? Oh, my goodness. Well, if you don't have one, then I'll just ask you to pray wherever you are. (laughs) What a joy to run out of bulletins. Thank you, Reba. (laughs) Thank you for that. If you have a bulletin, (laughs) I'll ask you to make that commitment and bring it up. If you do not, don't let anything stop you from making those commitments. Do you know what to do? All right, let's spend time in worship, and then we'll pray.